By way of introductions, I'm a task force leader in Incident Commander 4. Uh, I've fought my first wildfire in 1981, so I've been doing this a few years. And uh, I also teach these uh, topics at a, a state college in Tacoma, Washington. And I also own a, a fire services company. So what I hope to do today is we're going to talk about some of the wildland urban interface watch out situations. And we're going to prioritize our response objectives and then take that information and try to formulate some strategies and tactics. So you're going to bring your people home at the end of the day. And that's the idea is to bring your people home and try to minimize property loss, loss, loss of life, property loss, and bring your people home. What is it that makes someone, them so inherently dangerous? Well, the first thing is we're taking structural firefighters. And when you look at the skill set that's required to fight a fire, for instance, in New Jersey or New York, some of those old brick and in, in, in beam construction buildings, and you take that individual and you move them into a wildland setting, you're putting them into a whole different environment. And there's a whole different skill set. My structural experience is suburban. Now, I've got a lot of experience in suburban firefighting. In urban firefighting, I have very little. But when it comes to this, I know a lot. But more and more departments are being called upon to gain this skill set under the idea of all risk. One of the other issues of these fires is they typically don't know jurisdictional boundaries. They don't know where the fence stops. And when they don't know where the fence stops, what are you dealing with? Multi-jurisdictional incidents. Um, and so because of that, you're dealing with this very fluid mix of, a, of responders from various types of agencies. They may be from your state forestry. They may be from a volunteer fire department that goes on three fires a year. They may be from a career fire department. You're gonna have this big, wide diversity of responders and everybody wants to help. How do you deal with them? How do you plug them in? And you're going to have radio inoperability problems now. How do you communicate with everybody? On the Cedar Fire in San Diego in 2003, I saw three, 400 Type 1 structure engines show up from the various municipal fire departments around California that all had trunked radios. Forest Service is managing the fire works on the VHF. They're working at 100, I think they were 168, 172 megahertz in that range. And these guys show up with 800 megahertz radios. So you've got 400 engines that have no communications, even amongst themselves. Now some of these issues have been addressed by a lot of grants. FEMA has realized that this is a problem. There's been a lot of grants to address these issues. But it is still an issue. Now, about 90% of the fires that, that we deal with that I've dealt with through the years, we're able to catch those at the initial attack phase. We grab them quick, we put them out. We put the wet stuff on the red stuff, everybody goes home quickly. Okay? And under that, you've got your incident commander. And typically, who would be an incident commander on, on an initial attack incident? Yeah, the company officer. Yeah, your company officer. And you're going to have the firefighters working under them. Very simple organization, very efficient, very quick. Okay? And that's, our, that's actually what we want to do. We want to put this thing out fast and go home. But it doesn't always work that way. When we start to go into expanded and into the project incidents, we're now dealing with the classic ICS system. Now, when you show up at an incident, on, on one of these larger incidents, you're going to have an incident commander working at an incident command post. And you're going to check into this incident somewhere, somebody in the planning section. They're going to have a check-in area. You're going to check in. These are our resources. Here are our papers that we brought from our department. Or if you're a state mobilization, you're going you're to give them your documents. So they know who you are and what you, what you are. And then they're going to move you over probably to a staging area. And from there, you're, if you came in as a single resource, you're going to get uh, then attached to a, 
task force or a strike team. Does anybody know the difference between a task force and a strike team? The, the, it, it, it's, it's subtle. the difference is subtle, but it is important. Yes, please. Yes, yes. A strike team are all similar resources, whereas a task force would be mixed resources. You know, uh, a strike team of engines, five, six, seven type one engines. Uh, Task force would have a couple engines, a couple water tenders, maybe a dozer. Uh, of those two, what do you think is the most difficult to manage? I heard it. Task force. Task force. Because you've got, now you've got blended resources. But we were able to give it a little bit of defensible space. We went in there with some chainsaws and cut back some of the vegetation. And while we're doing this, what are we doing? Got to, we've got to look out. And also the other thing that we're doing, if we're doing anything around these structures, we're documenting it. And I'll show you for a very good reason on this structure. The last category when we're triaging these structures would be a rescue drive-by. And that would be a structure that really is a loser. And I don't mean in the sense that the people living there are losers or anything like that. I'm just saying that like that house that I showed you that was fully involved, it was one of these. Okay? There were too many risks around that house. Bad access, the way that it was built, and the, the amount of fuel around it. Um, in this case, what are we going to do? We're going to have a lookout. We're going to set trigger points. Get, get even, even close to this. We've got, if we've got fire close by, we're going uh, to have our lookout watching those trigger points really, really carefully for us. And we're going to do a rescue check. We're going we're gonna to check for life safety issues here. And if anybody's there, hopefully we can talk them into leaving. Um, 